Ever wondered which fancy restaurants from the 1960s have closed their doors? We're about to serve up the top 20 go-to dining spots that will remind you of a time when dinners were slow, chefs were stars, and every meal was a show. Forks ready? Let's dig into their stories. Burger Chef's got big, juicy, terrific burgers for you. Oh man, let me tell you about Burger Chef. Back in 1954, the folks at General Equipment Comer launched this jam and boy, did it take off? By 1973, Burger Chef was rocking over 1,200 locations, hot on the heels of McDonald's. They really set the stage for modern fast food with the introduction of the Fun Meal, which totally revolutionized kids' meals by including a toy. And guess what? They were also pioneers with the Works Bar, where customers could jazz up their burgers with a slew of fresh toppings. This focus on customization really catered to everyone's craving for personalization and set trends that other fast food chains would eventually adopt. Despite its cool factor and innovations, Burger Chef couldn't quite duke it out with McDonald's massive marketing and eventually, in 1982, sold to Hardee's. While most locations were transformed or shut down, Burger Chef's influence on fast food creativity and menu offerings lingers in the industry, still cherished by those who remember its glory days. Let's take a moment for Henry's Hamburgers, started by Bresler's Ice Cream Company in the mid-1950s as a direct competitor to McDonald's. They hit the ground running with killer deals like 10 burgers for $1, catering perfectly to the budget-conscious consumer. At their height in the 1960s, Henry's boasted about 200 outlets. They mastered the art of quick service and cost efficiency, precisely aligning with the burgeoning fast food era in America. However, their minimalist approach eventually backfired as consumer preferences evolved towards more diverse menus and improved dining atmospheres. This shift led to a decline as they couldn't keep pace with competitors who offered broader menus and better experiences. Today, only a few Henry's locations remain, serving as nostalgic reminders of a simpler time in fast food history. Despite their reduced presence, Henry's contributions to the industry, particularly in terms of pricing strategies and operational efficiency, continue to resonate as important lessons for fast food operations everywhere. Next up, Carol's. Originally a part of the Tasty Freeze family in the 1950s, which cleverly pivoted to burgers and rapidly expanded across the northeastern United States. Their signature club burger became a staple, and they diversified the menu to include fried chicken and breakfast items, catering to a variety of tastes and mealtimes. At their peak in the 1970s, Carol's captured the public's attention with catchy jingles and promotions that really capitalized on the burgeoning television advertising era. However, the increasing competition from fast food giants like McDonald's and Burger King, coupled with operational challenges, pressured Carol's into a significant transformation. In the 1980s, they began converting their locations to Burger King franchises, a move that marked the end of their run as an independent brand. Today, Carol's stands as one of the largest Burger King franchisees a testament to their ability to adapt and thrive under competitive pressures, illustrating the crucial adaptive strategies needed to survive in the cutthroat fast food industry. And don't forget about Red Barn, distinctive for its barn-shaped restaurants that created a fun, family-friendly dining experience. Founded in 1961, Red Barn expanded rapidly, introducing unique menu items like the Big Barney and Barn Buster Burgers. Their peak years in the late 60s and early 70s saw them introducing a self-service salad bar, enhancing the dining experience by adding a touch of freshness and innovation. However, as the fast food market grew increasingly competitive with chains expanding more aggressively, Red Barn struggled to maintain its footing. By the 1980s, it had mostly vanished from the landscape. Despite its closure, the nostalgic affection for Red Barn's innovative approach and distinctive architectural style endures, reminding us of its unique and memorable contribution to the fast food scene. The legacy of Red Barn continues to inspire the industry, 
demonstrating the impact of thematic and distinctive designs in enhancing brand identity and customer experience. Now, on to Gino's hamburgers. In 1957, NFL star Gino Marchetti launches a burger chain that quickly becomes a mid-Atlantic favorite. Gino's hamburgers was not just about eating. It was about enjoying a meal that felt a bit like home. With signature burgers and a flair for hearty, home-style cooking, Gino's carved out its niche. By the 60s and 70s, they expanded to over 300 locations, where Gino's became a community staple, bolstered by Marchetti's fame and a knack for engaging local fans. Yet, as the fast food giants grew and diversified their menus, Gino's struggled to maintain its hold, and ultimately, in 1982, the chain was sold to Marriott Corporation. Many of its locations transformed into Roy Rogers. Despite its end, Gino's is warmly remembered for its unique take on fast food and pioneering celebrity-driven marketing in the industry. Dive into Sandy's, the underdog from Peoria, Illinois, that started in 1956. Sandy's was a Midwest gem that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with McDonald's thanks to its founders, who were ex-McDonald's franchisees. They brought something special to the table, a Scottish-themed vibe and a focus on charbroiled burgers that really set them apart. Throughout the 1960s, Sandy's expanded to over 100 locations, embracing regional flavors and building a beloved brand in the Midwest. However, the 1970s brought tough challenges. Increased competition and higher costs pushed Sandy's to the brink. In a bid to survive, many locations converted to Hardee's in the late 70s. Today, Sandy's lives on in memories and reunions, celebrating its legacy in themed marketing and local flavor adaptations. Founded in 1927 by J. Willard Marriott, Hot Shops began as a humble root beer stand and quickly blossomed into a beloved chain of drive-in restaurants. Known for its family-friendly vibe and diverse menu, including the famous Mighty Mo Burger, Hot Shops became synonymous with quality and innovation. It thrived by adapting to America's love affair with cars, offering curbside meal deliveries that catered perfectly to mid-20th century car culture. During its heyday in the 1960s, Hot Shops was more than a restaurant. It was a dining experience that paved the way for what would eventually become Marriott International. However, as focus shifted toward the hotel industry, the restaurants gradually faded out, with the last Hot Shops closing in 1999. Yet, the legacy of Hot Shops endures, celebrated for pioneering service and hospitality in the dining world, leaving an indelible mark on the restaurant and hospitality industries. It's good, buddy. They grill the steaks just perfect. All right, let's chat about Lums, a place that really made its mark with something you might not expect in a fast food joint, beer-steamed hot dogs. Started by brothers Stewart and Clifford Perlman in 1956 down in Miami Beach, Lums was more than just a hot dog stand, it was a phenomenon. They expanded like wildfire during the late 60s and early 70s, at one point boasting over 400 outlets across the country. Their casual pub-like atmosphere made Lums the go-to spot for a fun family meal or a night out with friends. But like many good things, Lums' era of fast expansion came to an end. By the late 70s, the chain faced financial difficulties, and the Perlman brothers sold it off. Most locations shut down by the mid-1980s. Though Lums as a brand has largely vanished, a few spots still keep the nostalgia alive, reminding us of the unique flair Lums brought to the fast food scene with its distinctive beer-steamed offerings. Moving on, let's remember Sambo's, which opened its doors in 1957 in Santa Barbara, California. Founded by Sam Battistone Sr. and Newell Bonnet, Sambo's initially grew quickly, riding the wave of popularity to over 1,100 locations nationwide. Known for its budget-friendly, family-friendly meals, Sambo's catered to a broad audience with a casual dining setup that emphasized both value and convenience. However, the brand name, inspired by a racially insensitive children's book, eventually led to its downfall amidst growing racial sensitivity and public backlash. By the early 80s, amidst mounting controversy and a shifting market, 
most Sambo's restaurants had closed or rebranded. The original location in Santa Barbara remains, reimagined as a modern cafe that respects its complex past while aiming for inclusivity and change. Sambo's story serves as a poignant lesson on the impact of societal values on branding and the importance of cultural sensitivity in business. Don't forget about Noggles, which Dick Noggles started in 1970 after splitting from Del Taco. Noggles quickly carved out its niche by blending Mexican and American fast food, appealing to a wide audience with its innovative dual-line kitchen system that sped up service and kept the food fresh. This chain was a hit in Southern California, known for its bold flavors and generous portions, perfectly capturing the fusion of quick service and zesty Mexican flavors. Despite its success, after a hostile takeover, Noggles merged with Del Taco in 1988, leading to the brand's disappearance. However, the spirit of Noggles lives on. Recent revival efforts have seen a few new locations open, reigniting the passion for its unique menu and celebrating its legacy in the fast food industry. White Tower, the early bird in fast food, started back in 1926, taking cues from White Castle's playbook. White Tower was all about small, tasty burgers that were easy on the wallet, perfect during the Great Depression. Their striking white, tower-like buildings became iconic in urban centers across the Northeast and Midwest. But post-World War II, the landscape shifted with new competitors introducing modern fast food concepts. By the 1960s, White Tower was in decline, struggling against rivals and legal battles with White Castle. The brand couldn't innovate fast enough, leading to most locations closing or transforming by the late 20th century. Today, White Tower is a nostalgic whisper of early fast food history, remembered for its distinctive architecture and its role in popularizing quick, affordable burgers. Biff Burger, started in 1956 by Bruce Brain in Clearwater, Florida, Biff Burger was known for its unique cooking method the roto-broiled process. This technique, where burgers were cooked by flames as they passed through a revolving drum, set Biff Burger apart, making its food a tantalizing choice in the fast food market. The chain enjoyed popularity in the southeastern U.S., becoming a go-to spot for affordable, tasty fast food. Despite its initial success, Biff Burger couldn't withstand the competition from larger chains in the 70s, and began to decline. Today, Biff Burger is mostly a memory, with just a few signs and standalone locations remaining as relics of its once thriving operation. Its innovative approach to burger preparation remains a memorable part of fast food history, showcasing how technology can shape food service and customer experiences. Let's dive into Chi Chi's, a vibrant spot that opened its doors in 1975 founded by restaurateur Marno McDermott and former Green Bay Packers player Max McGee. Chi Chi's brought the festive flair of Mexican fiestas right to the dining table, differentiating itself with a lively atmosphere paired with authentic tasting Mexican dishes. Famous for its nachos, sizzling fajitas and potent margaritas, Chi Chi's quickly became a beloved dining destination spreading joy with over 200 locations nationwide by the 1980s. Families loved it for its festive vibe and affordable dining options. However, the brand faced a drastic downturn in the late 1990s, culminating in a severe hepatitis A outbreak in 2003 that irreversibly damaged its reputation. The outbreak led to numerous lawsuits and a decline in customer trust, forcing Chi Chi's to close all of its American locations by 2004. While Chi Chi's still operates in some European countries, it remains a lesson on the critical importance of maintaining food safety standards. Next up is Kenny Rogers Roasters, established in 1991 by country music star Kenny Rogers and former KFC CEO John Y. Brown Jr. The chain broke the mold in the fast food industry by focusing on healthy, wood-fired rotisserie chicken, a fresher alternative to the fried offerings that dominated the market. Kenny Rogers Roasters enjoyed a warm reception, 
expanding quickly both in the US and internationally, especially in Asia, where it resonated well with local tastes. Despite its promising start, the brand struggled to maintain momentum in the US due to stiff competition and a saturated market, eventually being acquired by Nathan's Famous in 1998. However, in Southeast Asia, Kenny Rogers Roasters found a lasting audience, where it continues to thrive, highlighting the potential for American fast food brands to flourish overseas by adapting to local preferences. Remember All-American Burger? Established in the early 1960s in Los Angeles, this chain catered to Southern California's car culture with its drive through service and made-to-order burgers using fresh, high-quality ingredients. It carved out a niche by offering a more personalized and upscale fast food experience, attracting a loyal following who appreciated its focus on quality. At its peak in the 1970s and 1980s, All-American Burger became a symbol of the classic California burger scene. However, as larger chains began to dominate with speedier service and lower prices, All-American Burger faced mounting challenges and began a slow decline. By the late 1990s, most locations had closed. Today, the brand lives on in the memories of its former patrons, serving as a nostalgic reminder of a time when quality and customization set the standard in fast food. Let's explore Zantigo, which kicked off in 1969 as a fresh take on fast Mexican food. Zantigo quickly won over fans with its chilitos, chili cheese burritos, tacos, and unique hot sauces. It carved out a distinctive niche in the Midwest, particularly in Minnesota, where it became a staple for fast Mexican food. Zantigo's unique selling proposition was its blend of authentic flavors served up fast, a hit among those craving quick, tasty Mexican fare. Despite its regional popularity, Zantigo struggled to expand beyond its core areas and was eventually bought out by Taco Bell in 1986. This acquisition marked the end of Zantigo as a standalone brand, with most locations converted to Taco Bell outlets. However, the legacy of Zantigo's bold flavors and unique dishes influenced Taco Bell's menu, and recent revival efforts have seen new Zantigo locations opening, aiming to recapture the original's charm and satisfy nostalgic cravings. Let's take a stroll down memory lane to 1967 when Minnie Pearl's Chicken first hit the scene, all decked out in the sparkle of country legend Minnie Pearl herself. The chain really played up Pearl's southern charm and wit, trying to give KFC a run for its money, with a menu packed with southern-style recipes perfect for family dinners. At its height, Minnie Pearl's had spots sprinkled all across the country, becoming a beloved stop in both rural areas and the south. But as with many tales of rapid expansion, they hit some snags, big ones with quality control and keeping the books straight, leading to a patchy experience for customers. These bumps, along with fierce competition, saw the brand dwindling by the late 70s. Today, Minnie Pearl's chicken is just a ghost of the past, a memory for those who got to taste its homestyle cooking. It's a real lesson in how crucial consistent quality and strong management are in the cutthroat world of fast food. Let me take you back to 1933 when Donald Valle opened Valle's Steakhouse in Portland, Maine. This wasn't just any steakhouse. It quickly became a culinary landmark, famous for its lavish steak dinners and swanky atmosphere. Unlike the simpler diners of its time, Valle's catered to folks craving both upscale meals and a plush dining experience. By the 60s and 70s, it was the go-to spot for big celebrations, making a name for itself up and down the East Coast. Picture this. A menu brimming with hefty steakhouse classics like prime rib and lobster, all reasonably priced. Not to mention the Big Val, a two-pound steak that was a real showstopper. Valle's was a community staple, hosting everything from family dinners to celebrity sightings, boosting its high-class image. But as dining trends shifted towards lighter, more casual fare in the late 70s, Valle's charm began to fade. By the late 80s, it had vanished, 
leaving behind fond memories and a lasting legacy in the golden age of American steakhouses. It's the early 1960s in New York, and here comes Wetson's, sweeping through with its iconic W logo and the catchy slogan, Buy a Bagful. Founded by Herb Wetson, this place was a beacon in the bustling New York market, where everyone's always on the go. Wetson's nailed it by serving up quick, tasty burgers and fries without busting your wallet, and it hit the spot for countless New Yorkers. At its peak, there were over 70 Wetson spots, each a haven for folks who loved good food fast. They even capitalized on the car craze with their convenient drive through service. But then came the 1970s oil crisis, and with McDonald's and Burger King flexing their massive marketing muscles, Wetson's just couldn't keep up. By the late 70s, they had to shut down. While mostly forgotten today, those who remember Wetson's recall a brand that set early standards for fast food conveniences, like drive through windows and value meals. Let's wrap up with Druthers, originally known as Burger Queen until it rebranded in 1981. This change was more than a simple name swap. It signaled a shift towards a more diverse menu that went beyond burgers to include fried chicken and breakfast items, aiming to appeal to a wider audience. Druthers became particularly popular in Kentucky and nearby states, where it built its reputation as a regional favorite, offering a comforting, down-home dining experience. Despite its efforts to adapt and diversify, Druthers faced intense competition from national fast food giants, which often overshadowed smaller regional players like itself. The pressure from these larger chains eventually led to the decline of Druthers, with most locations closing or rebranding once again by the late 1990s. Today, there's a single Druthers restaurant remaining in Campbellsville, Kentucky, serving as a nostalgic remnant of the chain's once prominent presence in the region. This location continues to remind us of Druthers' legacy as a once-beloved local chain that strove to keep up with the evolving tastes and demands of fast food enthusiasts. Missing those old-school fast food spots from the 60s? If so, like this video, click subscribe, and stay tuned for more nostalgia trips.